Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first uh, letter to the Corinthians, verse by verse. And in our last study, I think we had reached uh, about verse 9. But we're going to do a quick review. I hope it'll be quick. I, you know, I would like to do a review of where we've come so far and just sort of include a little bit of a peek ahead. So let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, so very grateful, so very thankful that you teach us and carry us along in the teaching of your word, that the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. We're so very thankful for the abundance of grace that you've given us, that you've shown us. I just ask that you would filter out all of that, which is foolish but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I want to take you back just a little bit in, uh, in our study, a uh, little bit of a brief historical overview of, if you can just kind of picture in your mind, uh, here was Jesus uh, on earth, uh, we're in the period of his ministry and those he confronted, the uh, chief priests, uh, the, the Pharisees, uh, the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, the opposition, uh, there was a transition that was occurring at this time from law to grace because Paul was instructed to carry the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. So the Gentiles were to be included, and the early church was primarily made up of Jews. If, if you go 100 years uh, after Christ, most of, well, all, all, I'd say all of the apostles are dead. And there's something new that's coming along here, and that is the righteousness of God that's based on faith. If, and, I, and this is just, I just remind you of back in our study through Romans verse by verse. If we go back to Romans 3, 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all, them that believe, for there's no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. So there was a transition taking place from law to grace. And it's no wonder that we see in various other parts of scripture how that legalism crept into the church early on from its, basically from its inception. Most of the Christians uh, in the first century, uh, primarily for the most part, many were, if not most, were Jews. And so we have early Judaism uh, infiltrating the church or mixing in law and grace, law mi being mixed in with grace. And so this righteousness, this whole idea uh, in which Paul is, is very, uh, very much, it was very much the Apostle Paul that introduced the whole idea through the Holy Spirit of righteousness, the righteousness of God based on faith. This righteousness that, based, that was based on faith was very young and immature in the church, which it, it, I said, I'm going to suggest that it could partially, at least, surely, it, it, at least to some extent, that error was responsible for much of the contention that we we are now seeing that took place in the church at Corinth, where that they were carnal and fleshly. I have always said that theological error 
precedes moral error. And so the Holy Spirit decrees at this particular time to here you have the Holy Spirit coming in and introducing himself, basically, to these believers at Corinth. The first letter to Corinth. And what does he do? Does he lambast them for all of their faults, all of their errors, all of their mixed up, messed up theology or, or messed up moral uh, attitudes? Does, is that what he does? No, it's not what he does. And in fact, what we see in the first nine verses, verses one through nine, is that the Holy Spirit through Paul, and I know, I understand Paul is the author, human author, but he merely held the pen and it was the Holy Spirit who decreed to write to these believers at Corinth And basically, and rather than lambast them for all of their faults and all of their errors, what he does in the first nine verses is he bowls them over with grace. He hits them with a sledgehammer of grace. He overwhelms them, in fact, with grace. If you take the time to take and, and, and really look closely at what is being said verses 1 through 9 of chapter 1. You cannot help but come away from that with the, the feeling that God's grace is just grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. The, the debt we enter into, verses 1 through 9, we, we enter, basically we have been sucked into a wormhole of God's amazing grace. You know, we use that word a lot. I've, I've mentioned this, I pointed this out in my last video, how that we are just overwhelmed by this marvelous grace. You have to ask yourself, you know, why are, is the church today in, in, in the year 2022 A.D., why is it not teaching this abundance of grace to believers? But th this is what the Holy Spirit does. And so what we saw is that we were set apart. Now, to be set apart by God, it's not that we sanctified ourselves. It's not that we set ourselves apart. Included in that word in the original language to be uh, hagias, uh, holy, you know, to be set apart. Includes the idea in the meaning of the word. It includes the idea of being separated from the world. And we know that we are in the world, but we're not of the world. And it is on that basis that we eagerly anticipate with great eagerness. Same thing with that word, the uh, eagerly anticipating, eagerly awaiting the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to go into the whole uh, discussion of, of, you know, well, when is that? Is that the second coming? Is that the rapture? Uh, if you follow this channel, you know we're pre-trib. Uh, you go to Matthew chapter 24, you're not going to, you're not going to see anything at all there about the rapture. Why? Because the rapture's already occurred. You're in the tribulation period. And yet they were told that the Lord was coming. The, uh, the word there in our text is, uh, is, a, is the word apocalypse. It's, it's the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll even go as far as to say, and this is just my understanding. I've never asked anybody to agree with me. Even our death is the rapture. And so we are eagerly anticipating the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, whether we're, we're caught up from the grave or whether we're alive when he returns. So these nine verses, uh, we just get sledgehammered 
by grace. And, and folks, I think that's wonderful. And we read on and we continue on in our study. And what we see is we see it very, very well. It's outlined. I mean, the Holy Spirit does a, a, a perfect job of laying out the truth concerning our position in Christ. Our position. Positional truth of how we stand before God without fault, without blame. And now we're entering into a section where we are instructed to be of the same mind and purpose. Same mind and purpose. And so we're going to look at that. This uh, In actually looking at the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm not sure how this is going to work out on the screen. This is, I'm not, I'm not accustomed to, to using a, you know, layering in, uh, you know, me on top of the text and all that. I don't know if that's, you're even going to see that or not. I'm going to try it and, and uh, do that because I've had people write me and tell me that that is of great help to them to see what, what we're looking at. Verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So just take a note of the fact that after we've been shown all of this grace this abundance of grace the next thought on the mind of the holy spirit is that there not be divisions among us we are all to speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you now folks listen to me it would be absolutely ludicrous to suggest that what that is saying is is that well we're you're to be of the same mind as me about it, about everything. That you're to speak the same thing as me. If we're not careful, uh, I guess in, in this is a little difficult for me to actually sort of construct into words, put into words. But I've never asked anyone to agree with me on anything. Uh, it's great if you if you think that, that I've said anything to help you along in, in your journey in, in this, through the studying of God's Word. But you are not a blessed hope forever right, okay? And we are all members of the one body, Christ. Christ has not been divided. Verse 11 says, For it's been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, the household of Chloe, that there are contentions or there's divisions among you. And years ago when I read this verse about Chloe, and, you know, the emphasis was on Chloe. You know, everything in my mind was about wanting to understand who Chloe was. Now, there's not a whole lot that I can say about Chloe. I do know that she was a woman, that she was a sister in the Lord, that believers met in households. They, many, in many cases, they lived with one another. And it, it doesn't mention all of those who are numbered among Chloe's household. But I don't think that that's the point of the verse. I mean, it could have been Justin's household. It could have been Caesar's household. It could have been Antonio's household. It could have been anyone's, but it was Chloe's, a sister in the Lord. And basically what Chloe's household had done is rat out these believers at Corinth. They, they were tattletales, okay? And thank God for that, because if they hadn't been, we would have not be reading what we're reading, uh, which is obviously for our benefit. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. 
So apparently Chloe's household were, well, a bunch of tattletales. You know, they ran to Paul or they contacted Paul and they pointed out that there were divisions among those there at Corinth. And Paul, of course, makes it ab absolutely crystal clear in, in the, the verses that follow. If you if you read all the way through, uh, down through the, well, verse 17, what we're seeing in, in, in summary and in, in short is, you know, you could wrap a neat, a nice, neat little ribbon around all those verses and you could say really what's, what's, What's happening here is, is that what the Holy Spirit is endeavoring to point out, which is of supreme importance, is the fact that it's not about us, it's about Christ. It's about Him. It's not about us. It's not about Paul. It's not about Cephas, Peter. It's not we can say that we, you can say, well, I'm of blessed hope forever, or I'm of Steve, okay, or I'm of Paul, or, or you can even say I'm of Christ. And when, even when you say, well, I'm of Christ, then you are basically separating yourself from everyone else, and you've, you've dismembered the body of Christ, and, and now you've set yourself apart as being, well, you're, you're the true followers of Christ. Or you're the true followers of Paul, who was was really understood more than we do about Christ, and so, but you know we are we are divided, and in an age of division, and I you know I don't want to kid off on a rabbit trail about how divided that we are today, but just as there's division today, and so much of it, we see this division early on in the church and this was not a good thing i i have spent dearly beloved i have spent hundreds of videos pointing out to you the, the simple fact the simple truth it's not hard to understand that our emphasis our focus our attention our affection is on christ not ourselves whether we're talking about ourselves personally and our walk and our understanding of, of Christ, it's it's about me. I've, I've got to do this. I've got to do that in order, in, in order to earn God's blessings or to warrant God's grace. And if I don't, well, then I'm, I'm of this other group. Folks, the text says that we're lacking in no spiritual graces. The word is, is grace, charis. It's not duran. It's not gift. And it's not singular. It is plural we are coming behind lacking in no no and that's a strong negative in the greek spiritual graces well you would wonder you know if anyone you'd, it would seem as if like i mean at least it seems to me like if anyone who's read verses one through nine how could they come away from that saying that we we are coming behind in any spiritual graces why is it that we are lacking in no spiritual graces? Why is that? Well, the message itself that we're, we're looking at is the context, the, the verses all the way, all the way through up to verse 17, basically and beyond most likely is a great testimony to the fact that we have been, just as Ephesians says, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. The message screams out the sufficiency of Christ, that what he did was sufficient, that we can't add anything to it. If we add anything to the finished work of Christ, we make it nothing. It amounts to nothing. So we're to be of the same mind and purpose. The only way that only the only explanation for that for that phrase, the only meaning that that could possibly hold to be of the same mind and purpose 
is to have our minds and our affections centered on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And the house of Chloe. And, you know, I, I used to think, you know, I would sit around thinking about Chloe and, and try to figure out, well, who is, who is Chloe? It's not about really as much about who Chloe was, but what it is worthy of taking note of is that if you, I'm speaking to all of you out here, if any one of you, if you look at your life and you see, you recognize, you believe that your attention, your focus is settled on things above, not on things below, on Christ and not yourself, on grace, not law, on the spirit, not the flesh, if that's, if that's what you believe, if that's how you, you live, you breathe, you walk in your relationship with your intimate fellowship with the Lord, if, if that's where you stand theologically, I'm going to suggest that you're a little different than Chloe and, and her household. The only way that Chloe could report to Paul, send, send message to Paul, about these divisions is if they were on track where they needed to be. And uh, I guess, you know, uh, uh, I told Sue earlier this morning, I'm going to try to bring in, uh, bring a little pulpit humor into the, you know, into this and say that, you know, and call Chloe's household just a bunch of tattletales. But basically, that's what they ratted them out. Okay. In other words, the household of Chloe, they got it, okay? That it's not about us. It's all about him. Even when it comes to the subject of baptism, because Paul was not emphasizing that, he was not by any means putting baptism down, okay? But... Note the fact, I want you to take serious note of the fact, that was not his emphasis. His emphasis was on one thing, and that is the gospel. The gospel. The message of the cross, which includes the simplicity of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. That's, that's what we do. And so to be in Christ, which is what we see used, that, that phrase, we see that used in the text. To be in Christ is to be a member of his one body. One body. It's not divided. It never has been divided and it never will be. It's, it's to be a member of his one body in which there is, here we go, here we go. Are, are you ready? No division. No division. And so that's basically where we're at. That's, that's somewhat of a rough summary, I'd say, of, of what I've seen here. Uh, in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. This ministry, the message of this ministry for five years now, has been that the old man cannot believe, receive, accept, repent, be baptized, or anything else. The natural man receiveth not the things of the, of the Spirit because they are spiritually discerned. They are spiritually discerned because God made us a new creation in Christ Jesus. He gave us ears to hear. The cross, the message of the cross, the preaching of the cross is not going to be foolishness to us but it is to the natural man, those who are perishing. And what seems to be on just on the surface, so simple 
to us. You know, it's the simplicity. There is a, folks, there's a simplicity in all the complexity of this. And that simplicity, and I, I'm, I'm borrowing a phrase from the New Testament, from Paul. The simplic, it's the simplicity of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not you in you, the hope of glory, or you in me, the hope of glory, but Christ in us, the hope of glory. The preaching of the cross. This, this, has, this verse 18 has profound implications. If you're ever disturbed by someone not receiving the gospel or rejecting the gospel message, you can be assured that the preaching of the cross is to them that, that are perishing foolish. Uh, I don't know, a number of times I've taken us back to John chapter 10, uh, just my sheep hear my voice. The, why can't you hear my voice? Because you are not my sheep. We've Christianity in the main has put the cart before the horse. They've made believing a prerequisite, a condition, okay, upon receiving eternal life, upon being born again, regenerated. And folks, that is not what this book says at all. The only reason that you could hear ever hear is because you're already his sheep. You've already by the blood of his cross, not by anything you did, but by the blood of his cross, you were justified, you were made righteous, and Christ could not have raised from the dead unless you had been made righteous. His death was substitutionary. He died in our place. We stand before God without spot, without wrinkle. He will present us the, his body without spot, without wrinkle. He will preserve us until the day of Jesus Christ. Confirmed until the end. And I, I don't know how many Christians I meet who are worried about whether or not they're going to make it to the end. And the, the reason they're so worried is because their focus, their attention is on their performance, not Christ's, not what he's done. And by that much, they made the cross of Christ of none effect, no effect. You've, you've taken reduced what Christ has done to nothing if you try to add anything to it. Please, dearly beloved, take serious note of the fact that from the first verse of chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, from the very first verse, all the way down to where we're at now, you have not been given, the, the Corinthians have not been given anything, any instruction at, for, as, for what to do in order for all of this to be true of them, okay? The truth is that all of the, we've, the grace that we've seen is true of us whether we believe it or not. Now, it helps a lot if you do. It, it certainly does make a enormous difference and will have an enormous difference in your life if you believe what God has said. Uh, believers, the word, the term believers, as I've pointed out, is a term of endearment. You can, you can be a believer and not believe, not, not be trusting God. You can be his child and not be trusting the fa your father in heaven. Not be trusting the Lord. Not, be, not place your faith in the faithfulness of Christ. It doesn't change the fact of who you are. We have been introduced here. The Holy Spirit has introduced these Corinthians to the marvelous truth concerning their, their being a new creation in Christ Jesus. And I want you to point out, I, I want to point out, I want you to take note of the fact that of, of just how difficult this must have been for these early believers at Corinth or the early church in general, the first century church, or that the church was primarily Judaistic. Judaism infiltrated the, the church. 
we go over to the book of Galatians, the epistle to the Galatians, Paul's epistle to the Galatians, and we read of this very thing. The early church was permeated with legalism. Now, if you take a look at the modern structure of, of what we call contemporary Christianity today, little has changed. Little has changed. I, I gave up hope about 30 years ago of Christianity ever changing. You know, I, it, there, there were, I, I think it lasted, I, I did have this early idea when I first became a Christian that somehow I was going to change the entire landscape of Christianity across America because I had come to discover that his work was sufficient, that he died in my place, that I, I stood before him without fault, and that he's, he had blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And, and so many of my Christian friends didn't know this, this but I was going to get out there and I was going to really transform the, the nation, okay, with these with with these wonderful truths, uh, that those feelings lasted just maybe a couple days. Long enough for me to realize that not only was that legalism a problem in the church as, as a whole, in the main, but that even I was at a, a maturity level in which even that legalism crept into my own life. I don't want to get uh, really any any further past 18 for right now. I do want to read this. Uh, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together. That's a perfect passive. In the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are, are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you says, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You know, I, I could... You know, I could, I could almost say, you know, the same thing. Was was Steve crucified for you? Okay. Or, or were you baptized in the name of Steve? Paul says, I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. If baptism, if baptismal regeneration, you know, you've got to be baptized in order to be, you know, qualify for heaven. If that were true, Paul would have much more emphasis on baptism than what he does. That's also worthy of pointing out. I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. I've, I've thought about that verse a lot over the years, and not with wisdom of words. You can be the most eloquent speaker uh, on the planet, and and there'd be nothing but a bunch of garbage come out of your mouth every time you open. It's certainly not a, a prerequisite or a qualification for being a minister or anyone else. If you stutter, if you stammer, if you stumble if, in, in trying to make a sentence, if you're dyslexic, if, if you're sh shy, and timid and afraid doesn't make any difference. The message of Christ, dearly beloved, is so, the message of the cross is so simple that it's, it's practically beyond description. It 
it seems like it wouldn't need a whole lot of describing or explaining. The cross crucifies. It crucifies. And most Christians I know are fully aware of the fact that that crucifixion occurred in the life of Jesus Christ. It was our Lord who was crucified. But very few, I've met very few over the years, who understand that when Christ died, we died with him. We were crucified with him, buried with him, raised with him, okay, from the dead. But when he was raised, we were raised to walk in newness of life. Not in oldness of the letter that kills, okay? Law kills, okay? If you are a Christian who's trying to keep the law, who believes that the law is part of the New Testament Christian's job description, then you are involved in an activity that is driving you further and further away from your intended goal, which is to, to be close to Christ, to be in fellowship with Christ. You, we, folks, we cannot be, say that we're in fellowship with Jesus Christ while trying to keep the law. I'm not by any means suggesting that there's no fellowship there. But the fellowship that you really want, the fellowship that you, that you really desire is based upon the understanding that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And folks, the gospel message must be clearly, especially now in this day, present, our current, present time, defined most accurately and reverently. What is the gospel? Well, to most Christians, the gospel is if you do, you know, you know, the ABCs, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I don't know how far it goes with some people. But if you if you cross all your, your T's and you dot all your I's, if you do everything that you're supposed to do, and not just do that initially, but maintain that standard throughout the rest of your life, then you'll go to heaven. That's, that's the gospel. That's great news, isn't it? Isn't that great news? That, you know, that you have to do... You have to qualify first for entry into heaven. Well, that's, that's really great news. And then you have to maintain, you have to continue. And isn't that great news, you know, that you've got you to first qualify for heaven and then you have to persevere in order to maintain that qualification so that you truly enter into the kingdom of God. That's great news, isn't it? I'm going to tell you that is not the great news. That is not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is simple. It was that he lived, he died, he lived the perfect life that you could never live. He died in, in, a, in your place. He was crucified, buried, raised again from the dead. That's the good news. You, that we have a kinsman redeemer who suffered, who died in our place, who removed, who absolutely, 100% removed any chance whatsoever of any condemnation, but more than that, we are made righteousness, the very righteousness of God in Christ. Isn't it interesting? Christ came as a dual natured, you know, even, even the constellation Sagittarius, Sagittarius, the centaur, okay, it describes a being which has two natures, okay? You know, it's, you know, half man, half horse, two natures. We know Christ had two natures. He was fully man and fully God. When you were made a new creation in Christ, you now received as, as a new creation in Christ, a new nature, a sinless new nature. We saw this when we studied through 1 John that cannot sin, cannot sin. 
We have been so closely identified with our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, as well as our Deliverer. We have been so closely identified with Him that it's, I think, if I didn't know any better, I, I think God just would, is scratching His head, you know, wonder, you know, has got to be wondering, trying to figure out why so many of His people are so reluctant to feel like that they qualify to have an ongoing intimate relationship with the Son, His Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Given the fact that, of, of all that's taken place, given the fact that all that, it, that God has done for us in Christ, and folks, this is how the letter to the 1 Corinthians starts out. It starts out on that, on that basis, and so we have that groundwork that's, got, that's going before us here. So that where the wherever we travel, wherever we continue on through in through the letter, everything that we we see later on is going to be is going to be to rest upon the shoulders of what we've seen here. Uh, truly, for, dearly beloved, His grace amazes me, and I hope it amazes you. I love you all. I truly do. I hope you're all safe and well. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.